The Cricket in Times Square by George Selden. Chapter Twelve. Mr. Smedley. It was two o'clock in the morning. Chester Cricket's new manager, Tucker Mouse, was pacing up and down in front of the cricket cage. Harry Cat was lying on the shelf with his tail drooping over the edge, and Chester himself was relaxing in the matchbox. I've been giving the new situation my serious consideration," said Tucker Mouse suddenly. As a matter of a fact, I couldn't think of anything else all day. The first thing to understand is Chester Cricket is a very talented person. Here, here," said Harry. Chester smiled at him. He was really an awfully nice person. Harry Cat was. The second thing is, talent is something rare and beautiful and precious, and it must not be allowed to go to waste. Tucker cleared his throat. <clears throat> and the third thing is, there might be who call, could tell a little money in it. Maybe I knew that was at the bottom of it," said Harry. Now wait, please, Harry. Please just listen a minute before you begin calling me a greedy rodent," said Tucker. He sat down beside Chester and Harry. The newsstand is doing lousy business, right? Right. Always wanting to get rid of him, right? Right. She liked him today because he played her favorite songs. But who could tell how she might like him tomorrow? And also, I like to help them because they've been as so good to me," put in Chester Cricket. But naturally," said Tucker, "and if a little bit of a rewards of success should find its way into the." Dream pipe where lives an old and trusted friend of Chester. Well, who is the worst for that? I still don't see how we can make any money," said Chester. "I haven't worked out the details," said Tucker. "But this I can tell you: New York is a place where the people are willing to play, pay for talent. So." What's clear is Chester has got to learn more music. I personally prefer his own compositions. No offense, Chester. Oh no," said the cricket. "I do myself, but the human being, Tucker went on, being what human beings are, and who could blame them? Who would rather hear pieces written by themselves? But." How can I going to learn new songs, Exchester? Easy as pie," said Tucker Mouse. He dared over the the radio, leaned all his weight on one of the dials, and snapped it on. Not too loud," said Harry Cat. "The people outside will get suspicious." Tucker twisted. The dial until a steady, soft stream of music was coming up. Just play it by ear," he said to Chester. That was the beginning of Chester's formal musical education. On the night of the party, he had just been playing for fun, but now he seriously set out to learn some human music. Before the night was over, he had memorized three movements from difficult symphonies. Funnies, half a dozen songs for a musical comedy. The solo part for a violin concerto, and four hymns, which he picked up from a late vacation service. The next morning, which was the last sat- Sunday in August, all three villains came to open the new set. They could hardly believe what had happened yesterday, and were anxious. To see if Chester would continue to sing familiar songs, Maria gave the cricket his usual big breakfast of mulberry leaves and water, which Chester took his time eating. He could see that everyone was very nervous, and he sort of enjoyed making them wait. When breakfast was over, he had a good stretch, 
and limber his wings. Since it was Sunday, Chester thought it would be nice to start with a hymn, so he chose to open his concert with Rock and Ages. At the sound of the first notes, the face of Mama and Papa and Mario broke into smiles. They looked at each other and their eyes told how happy they were, but they didn't dare to speak a word. During the pause after Chester had finished Rock of Ages, Mr. Smiley came up to the newsstand to buy his monthly copy of Musical America. His umbrella knitted folded was hanging over his arm as usual. Hey, Mr. Smiley, my cricket plays hums! Maria blurted out even before the music teacher had a chance to say good morning. An opera, said Papa. An Italian song, said Mama. Well, 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 said Mr. Smiley, who didn't believe a word, of course. I see we've all become very fond of our cricket. But are we letting our imagination run away with us a bit? Oh no, said Maria. Just listen. He'll do it again. Just took a sip of water and was ready to play some more. This time, however, instead of Rock of Ages, he launched into a string performance of Onward Christian Soldiers. Mr. Smith's eyes popped, his mouth hung open and the color drained from his face. Do you want to sit down, Mr. Smiley? asked Papa. You look like pale. I think perhaps I'd better, said Mr. Smiley, with Purring his forehead with a silk handkerchief. It's rather a shock, you know. He came inside the newsstand and sat on the stool, so his face was just a few inches away from the cricket cage. Chester created the second verse of Armor Christian Soldiers and finished with a soaring amen. Why the Organists played that in church this morning, exclaimed the music teacher briskly, and it didn't sound half as good. Of course, the cricket isn't as loud as an organ, but what he lacks is volume. He makes up for its sweetness. That was nothing, said Papa Bonani proudly. You could hear, hear him play Ida. May I try an experiment? asked Mr. Smelly. All the balloons said yes at once. The music teacher whistled the scale. Do, re, mi, fa, so, wa, ti, do. Chester flexed his legs and as quickly as you can run your fingers up the strings of a harp he, play, he had played the whole scale. Mr. Smelly took off his glasses. His eyes were moist. He has Absolute pitch, he said in a shaky voice. I have met only one other person who did. She was a soprano named Arbella Hufflefinger. Just started to play again. He went through the two other hymns he learned. The Rosalie and a mighty fortress in our God. And then did the violinist concerto. Naturally, he couldn't play it just as it was written without the whole orchestra to back him up, but he was magnificent. All things considered, once Mr. Smelly got used to the idea that he was listening to a concert given by Cricket, he enjoyed the performance very much. He especially praised for Chester's phrasing by which he meant the neat way the cricket played all the notes of a passage without letting them slide together. And sometimes when he had been deeply moved by a section, the music teacher would touch his chest over his heart and say, That cricket has it here! As Chester chirped his way through the program, a crowd collected around the newsstand. After each new piece, the people applauded and congratulated the balloonists on their remarkable cricket. Mama and Papa were fit to burst with pride. Marie was very happy too, but of course he had thought all summer that Chester was a very unusual person. When the playing was over, Mr. Smelly stood up and shook his hands with Papa, Mama, and Marie. I want to thank you for the most Delightful hour I have ever spent, he said. 
The whole world should know of this cricket. A light suddenly spread over his face. Why I believe I shall write a letter to the musical adapter of the New York Times, he said. They'd certainly be interested. And this is the letter Mr. Smedley wrote. To the music editor of the New York Times and to the people of New York. Rejoice, oh New Yorkers, for a musical miracle has come to pass in our city. This very day, Sunday, August 28th, surely a day which will go down in musical history. It is my pleasure and privilege to be present at the most beautiful recital ever heard in a lifetime devoted to the sublime art, music that is. Being a musical just myself and having graduated with honors from a well-known local school of music, I feel I am qualified to judge such matters. And I say without hesitation that never have such strains been heard in New York before. But who was the artist the Asian music lover will ask? What is perchance some new singer just lately arrived from a triumphant tour of the capitals of Europe? No music lovers, it was not. Then was it some violinist who pressed his cheek with love against his darling violin as he played? Run again, music lovers. Could it have been a pianist with sensitive long fingers that drew magic sounds from the shining ivory kiss? Ah, music lovers, you will never guess. It was a cricket, a simple cricket no longer than half my little finger, which is rather long because I play the piano, but a cricket that is able to chirp operatic, symphonic, and popular music. Am I wrong then in this describing such an event as a miracle? And where is this extremely performer? Not in the Carnage Hall, music lovers, nor in the Metropolitan Opera House. You will find him in the newsstand run by the Bellamy family in the subway station at Times Square. I urge, I implore, even man, woman, and child who has music in the soul not to miss one of his illustrious name, his glorious concerts. Intensely yours, Horatio P. Simile. P.S. I also give piano lessons for information. Write to HP Simile. 1578 West 63rd Street, New York, NY. The end of the chapter 12.